Welcome to our masterclass at Israel Investment Advisors, From Startup Nation to Scale Up Nation, From Strong Foundations to Potential for Long-Term Growth. My name is Brian Friedman. A little more about me later. Let's dive right in. You're about to discover the unique and fast growth story of Israel in the developed world. It's a, uh, according to Dan Sr.'s book, Startup Nation, it's a story not just of talent, but of tenacity, of insatiable questioning of authority, of determined informality, combined with a unique attitude toward failure, teamwork, mission, risk, and cross-disciplinary creativity. Former President Shimon Peres said, starting with the Israeli mind, in, in Israel, a land lacking in natural resources, we learn to appreciate our greatest national advantage, our minds. Through creativity and innovation, we transformed barren deserts into flourishing fields and pioneered new frontiers in science and technology. Who is this master class for? It's for American accredited investors with a pro-Israel mission. It's for experienced investors wanting to diversify their foreign portfolio. It's for savvy investors with a keen eye for foreign markets. For foundations that want to ensure their investment dollars align with their core mission and values while fulfilling the highest level of tzedakah. It's for Israel bondholders wanting to expand their long-term investments in Israel. Who is it not for? It's not for investors looking for short-term profits. It's not for investors who are looking for guaranteed returns. It's not for investors who see Israel only as an emerging economy. And it's not for investors who are skeptical of Israel's future and resilience. Get ready to learn about the following in this masterclass the extraordinary growth Israel has experienced over the last four decades, Israel's transition from startup nation to scale-up nation, the opportunities behind the restructuring of the Israeli economy, and why impact investment is the foremost, high, uh, highest form of tzedakah. Here's some key takeaways. You'll be able to align your investment dollars with your core values, and learn how to expand your investment portfolio to the Israeli market. Now is the time to deepen your impact. You are witnessing the transformation of the Israeli economy and the relationship between the Israeli and American Jewish communities. By learning about the major shifts in Israel over the last 30 years and analyzing the financial trends, you can realign your values and mission with Israel by supporting Israel's upward movement from startup nation to scale up nation. Just a few words about me. I am a portfolio manager with more than 30 years of experience following the Israeli economy as an analyst, portfolio manager, and economist. I'm one of the very few Americans who has actively invested in the Israeli markets for the last 30 years. And we founded Israel Investment Advisors 11 years ago in 2010 to benefit from the burgeoning capital markets in Israel and to cater to clients who support Israel by investing in Israeli publicly traded companies on the stock market. Okay, who is ready to dive in and explore more details about the Israeli market? We're going to divide the presentation tonight into three phases. We're going to use history in a somewhat summary form as our guide. We're gonna start with the early years when Israel planted the seeds for innovation and began the process of that extraordinary growth to startup nation. Then we're going to discuss some of the headwinds Israel faced in the, in the 80s in particular, and why Israel had to restructure itself to seize massive opportunities as, uh, as the economic winds shifted. And we call that this restructuring of the Israeli economy. And then finally, we're going to discuss the future. Where is Israel going and why do we think 
that it's an opportunity. Let me just take a quick minute and uh, say that at the end of my presentation, I will address any questions you might have. Please enter them in the Q&A function uh, on your screen. And we'll address all of those at the end of the presentation. Okay, let's begin. Planting the seeds for innovation, the extraordinary growth of Israel as the startup nation. The story of Israel as a startup nation actually begins before the state of Israel begins in the 1920s and the 1930s, when Israel established an uh, economic system from its infancy. It overcame a lack of natural resources. It created social organizations to support the market. It promoted and facilitated immigration, aliyah, the aliyot that came in waves starting in the late 1880s, but mostly in the 1920s, the 1930s, and the 1940s and 50s. They laid the foundation for what would become the state and then a flourishing economy that hit rocky waters in the 1980s. From those humble beginnings, Israel transformed itself in the 2010s in, from a socialist system into what it is today, more of a capitalist system on its way to a free market system. Today, Israel's got the second largest number of technology startups in the world behind only the United States. They've discovered vast natural gas resources offshore in the Mediterranean. And Israeli gross domestic product per capita, which now exceeds $40,000 per year, is higher than France, Japan, or Italy. Israel has transformed from its very humble emerging market roots to become a fully fledged member of the developed dem democratic world. But the story wasn't linear. As we all know, Israel had its ups and its downs, both from a security point of view, but also from an economic point of view. With hindsight, Israeli economic development has been somewhat miraculous, but we're going to dive into some of the details to explain how it occurred and the, the painful, sometimes painful steps that were required to get there. So let's start in the early years, right after the creation of the state in the 1950s and the 1960s. As I just said a minute ago, Israel was created mostly by Eastern European socialists. They created a state-directed economy, a heavily unionized economy, but nonetheless, an economy that was quite successful in its early years because it catered to a very small population. Before the state of Israel was created in 1948, there were about 600,000 Jews living in what would become the state of Israel. And then following World War II, the survivors of the Holocaust doubled the Israeli population in just a few short years, followed by waves of immigration from the Arab and Muslim world in the 1950s. Nonetheless, Israel was a very small scale society at that time with tremendous material needs. They, the socialist structure that they created actually responded to those needs very effectively because Israel was too small to create a truly competitive economy with large scale business enterprises. So during the 1950s, economic growth averaged about 10% per year, similar to the growth rates that you probably heard about in China in the 1990s and early 2000s. Although it was a socialist system, it, did, it was fairly effective. However, as Israeli society grew, as the population expanded, that socialist system began to malfunction. It created bottlenecks and problems as Israel entered the late 1960s and the 1970s. In particular, the period between 1967 and 1975, when Israel fought two major wars and 
There was the oil embargo, the Arab oil embargo of the early 1970s, which, which ushered in an era of global stagflation, stagnant economic growth and escalating inflation. Israel was not only not immune from these global problems, they were impacted by them even more so because their socialist state-run economic system was not up to the challenge of all of the economic volatility of the 1970s and early 1980s. Above all else, the costs of running a, uh, that Israel incurred during the 1967 war and ultimately the 1973 war really broke the budget and a lot of the state-run economic enterprises, which were highly inefficient by that time, just were not up to the challenge. In particular, in the early 1980s, stagnant economic growth and rising inflation caused banks in Israel to require additional capital to shore up their balance sheets, and they weren't able to raise sufficient capital to do so. By 1983, the banking system was collapsing, the broader financial system was collapsing, inflation in Israel was accelerating all the way up to four and 500%. Israel was in an economic freefall and the government had to step in and nationalize the banking system and uh, do something quite drastic to change this now failing economic structure. In 1983, when the financial system collapsed, you can only imagine the drama. The Tel Aviv Stock Exchange closed for 18 days. Just to put things into perspective, the last time the stock market closed due to a major crisis in the United States was just in the aftermath of September 11, 2001, when it closed for just under a week. So on the scale of financial crises, 1983 ranks up there in Israel among the great financial crises like the 1929 stock market crash, the technology bubble bursting, the financial crisis. The crisis revealed major structural flaws in the Israeli financial system and the economy. But it also laid the foundation for Israel's future economic success. I visited Israel for the first time in 1984. It's why I became interested in the Israeli economy and the markets. When I landed in Israel as a young teen, actually at that time, Israeli, the inflation rate in Israel was already exceeding 400%. Prices were changing multiple times a day. The Israeli shekel was uh, plummeting relative to the dollar. Just a few months later, uh, an election uh, was held and the outcome produced a national unity government, the first transition government uh, whereby power was shared and the prime minister changed hands halfway through the term. Just, I'm bringing that up because we happen to be living through that kind of government right now in Israel. Nonetheless, back then, the two leading Israeli political parties, Labour and Likud, formed a national unity coalition and implemented what they came, what they called the Economic Stabilization Plan. This stabilization program ushered in Israel's uh, climb out of distress to ultimately economic success. What was the economic stabilization plan. In 1985, the National Unity Government enacted a sweeping economic plan to curb hyperinflation. The government slashed spending, imposed wage and price controls, stopped printing money to fund budget deficits, and ultimately put the central bank, the Bank of Israel, that's Israel's equivalent of the Federal Reserve, on an independent footing. They depoliticized the monetary system, and the banking system. Within two years, the inflation rate dropped from almost 500% to 20% and fell to single digits by 1995. 
they put in a new currency. They replaced the old shekel with the new shekel. In fact, the currency of Israel is still called the new Israel shekel. As economic uh, growth resumed and inflation eased, the banks slowly recovered. The government nursed the economy to health in the years following the economic stabilization plan, thereby restoring the profitability and capital base of the banking system. I'm focusing on the banking system because it's very critical to the whole story. It's ultimately what created the financial market economy that we're now, uh, that Israel has now, that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Due to the economic stabilization plan, the economic crisis receded in the 1990s. And the government-owned banking and financial system that uh, the Israeli government nationalized in the early 80s was now ready for privatization. They had been recapitalized. They had put, been put on a sounder commercial footing. Um, but of course, there were, because Israel had came from a socialist root, uh, had socialist roots, their private sector was quite small. The number of wealthy people was relatively small. And there was not a great deal of foreign interest in Israeli assets at that time. So although Israel was ready to begin privatizing its banking system and to private, privatize many of its state-owned companies, there weren't that many buyers. And the financial condition of these companies was not all that great. So Israel had to do things gradually and recognize the reality that they were going to have to transition from a monopolistic socialist economy to a private economy slowly. And that's what happened. Between 1993, when they began the privatization process, and 2018, when they ended the privatization process, the Israeli government gradually sold bank stocks and released control to the private sector. Although the final privatization transaction occurred in 2018, most of the control over Israeli banks and many of the state-owned companies actually occurred in the, in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Privatization and deregulation of the financial system has allowed the Israeli economy to slowly break the chains of a concentrated and monopolistic market. There was one sector, however, which was outside of the historic uh, socialist system, which was more like the Wild West and led Israel to become what is now known as the startup nation. The high-tech sector has developed rapidly since the late 1990s with freedom from overbearing government regulations, free flow of capital and Israeli human capital with a strong affinity towards technology. Israel has become a powerhouse of technology creating and selling it to major global companies. But the startup nation, which was freewheeling and outside the old socialist structures, faced a problem over the course of time because it interacted with the old financial system uh, that had been created in the early years of the socialist uh, economy. While many, we call that the early exit problem. While many invest in startup companies, there are many investors that invest in Israeli technology startups. Their benefit uh, until very recently had been quite limited. In fact, just to put some numbers on it, technology as important as it is, is only about 9% of Israeli gross domestic product and about an equivalent 9% of Israeli jobs. Important, but smaller than you might imagine. They've had some trouble growing because though they have the potential to grow into multinational corporations with very substantial revenues and profits, the opportunity, sometimes the necessity to sell out to a bigger company, often a foreign company, usually American, is ultimately limiting the Israeli economy's long-term growth. Why? Because the financial markets had been relatively small in Israel, although growing too small and forcing many of these very promising companies 
to sell out too soon. Just to illustrate how important this issue is, I'm showing Facebook. And what you're seeing on the screen right now is how many employees Facebook had before it went public in 2012. As you can see, 4,600. And then what the growth in Facebook was following its IPO, its initial public offering. As you can see, 92% of Facebook's current workforce was hired after it went public on the stock market. That makes perfect sense. If you want to grow to a very large size, you need to access capital on a large scale. Companies that access capital on a large scale in the United States do it on the stock market and on the bond market. That is how it's done. One of the problems of Israel's small markets has been that they, up until very recently, have not been able to access large-scale capital, forcing them sometimes to sell out at too early of a stage to larger competitors. That is starting to change, and part of the reason it's starting to change is because of non-Israeli foreign investors like us and like you. Okay, I laid out some of the history. Israel started as a socialist economy. Socialist economies tend to be monopolistic, state-run, but Israel wasn't completely a socialist economy. It was not an Eastern European or a Soviet system by any stretch of the imagination. It always had a private sector. And that private sector was small, but it existed. And it set the example along with the technology sector, which was entirely in the private sector, for how the Israeli economy could be run as the state backed out of its socialist ways and privatized and began to restructure uh, the economy. The economic stabilization plan of 1985 curbed Israel's hyperinflation by slashing spending, imposing wage and price controls, and ceasing money printing to fund budget deficits. The current wave of economic restructuring has been facilitated by four major drivers of economic growth. I've already mentioned privatization. We'll talk more about how privatization occurred. Then there's been a series of governmental reforms that have been of extreme importance that are quite well known in Israel, but not very familiar to American investors. And we'll break each of them down. They revolve around committees that issued reports that the parliament, the Knesset, um, enacted over the last 15 years. The first one was called the Bahar Committee, then the Concentration Committee, and most recently, the Sturm Committee. First, privatization. Most importantly, with the banks. Between 1993 and 2018, the government sold bank stocks in blocks of varying size, sometimes in public offerings on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange and at other times directly to private investors. After 25 years of gradual privatization, the government completed the process with its final 5% sale of uh, Bank Leumi in 2018. In addition to the banks, the Israeli government and the largest labor union in Israel called the Histadrut sold off hundreds of businesses in the 1990s and the early 2000s. There are many, many examples, but some that may or may not be familiar to those of you who have traveled to Israel are, for example, Tanuva, Israel's dairy company, Hamash Beer, one of the leading department store chains, Israel's largest construction company, Shikun Vibinui, the list goes on, including companies in retail, manufacturing, and mobile telephony. All of these businesses were either sold directly to private investor groups or on the, listed on the stock exchange. There was a problem, however. Privatization removed the state and the Histadrut from the dominant positions in economic life. But instead of eliminating monopolies, the privatization process merely transferred them to private ownership. Further reforms were necessary to promote business competition. If you remember, I outlined a three-phase transition. The first phase was planting the seeds. That, that was Israel's socialist phase. 
The second phase was privatization. Unfortunately, in the privatization phase, many of the companies that were in state hands or the labor union hands were, were weak financially due to years of mismanagement. So they were sold at low prices. Well, the new owners did two things. They uh, made these companies much more efficient, but they also further exploited their monopoly advantages, raising prices, albeit increasing profits in the process, but they created what became a private but monopolistic economy. Well, that required further reform. The first major reform, once again, was in the financial sector under the label of the Bihar Committee. In fact, Yossi Bihar, who this committee was named after, who probably um, is a figure that is under-recognized, uh, even in Israel, unfortunately passed away not too long ago. But re he really initiated the next phase. I call it sometimes Israel's Teddy Rose Roosevelt phase, the breaking up of the monopolies, the trust-busting phase. That began, that was initiated with the Bihar Committee in 2005. The Knesset passed the Law for Encouragement of Competition and Reduction of Conflicts of Interest in the Israeli Capital Markets. That broke up this monopolistic structure. And what did the Bihar Committee do? Number one, they separated capital markets activities from banking activities. They opened up the stock market and the bond market to new players that could compete with the incumbent banks. A lot of people don't realize in Israel, there were three major banks that dominated about 80% of all financial activity. Bank Leumi, Bank HaPoalim, and Israel Discount Bank. They're still the three biggest banks in Israel. But at that time, just prior to the Bihar Committee, these three banks controlled 80% of everything, including asset management, securities underwriting, lending, deposit gathering. The, Bah the Bahar Committee did not break up the traditional commercial banking activity of taking in deposits and making loans. But what it did do was allow new players into both the securities underwriting, meaning more stocks and more bonds, and asset management. In fact, uh, the pension system, which is a huge source of capital in Israel, was uh, spun out and mostly uh, managed by the leading insurance companies, creating a whole series of new competitors to the banks. The Bihar reforms mandated that the three largest banks restrict their securities underwriting and investment banking activities, as well as divest their pension fund and asset management operations. Israel's five major insurance companies, Migdal, Klal, Harel, Phoenix, and Menora, acquired the asset management subsidiaries and became very viable competitors to the three incumbent banks. The Bihar legislation also empowered a previously enfeebled cottage industry of independent asset management companies and investment banks. Although traditional bank lending remained concentrated, the stock and bond markets gained traction as viable alternative financial uh, channels. Okay, that was uh, highly effective. It began to inject competition into the financial sector, but much of the Israeli economy was still concentrated, controlled by what the Israelis called the tycoons. So as a result, um, as a result, uh, more reform was needed. In the aftermath of the financial crisis, many of the tycoons got into some financial hot water investing in real estate outside of Israel. The Israeli government used that as an opportunity when they were weakened to enact sweeping reform. So they uh, initiated uh, in October 2010, the Committee for the Promotion of Competition in the Economy also known as the Concentration Committee. The Knesset unanimously, let me just reemphasize that unanimously, all political parties across the spectrum uh, agreed that to pass the law for the promotion of competition and reduction of concentration uh, to start breaking up the monopolies and inject more competition into the economy.
This law launched a profound economic restructuring reminiscent of Teddy Roosevelt's early 20th century trust busting in the United States. The law limited large business pyramids to three levels, and more importantly, mandated separate beneficial ownership of financial and non-financial companies. We in the United States also have this very same law that was passed in the 1920s and the 1930s. Israel is going through its moment of the progressive era, not the current progressive era, the progressive era of the early 20th century. It's going through that process now as we speak, as we witness it before our very eyes. Diversifying the ownership of many Israeli companies will ultimately benefit the companies and their investors. More efficient capital markets, improved liquidity, and potentially higher valuations are byproducts of the growing competition. Recognizing that they left the uh, concentrated structure of the original traditional commercial banking system, in 2017, the Israeli government doubled down once again. For decades, Israel's two largest banks, Bank of Poalim and Bank Leumi, oversaw the country's most popular credit cards. In 2017, the Israeli government passed the law for increasing competition and reducing concentration in the Israeli banking market. The law ordered the banks to divest their credit card subsidiaries. Why is this important? because those two credit card companies will be allowed to become, this has already occurred by way, one was sold to a private equity, the other is now listed on the uh, Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. New banks are going to grow up around these uh, credit card companies. And once they've achieved a certain market share, the incumbent banks will, allow to be, will be allowed to get back into the credit card business, creating five major banks in place of the prior three. Um, of the big three, by the way, only the two major really controlled the credit card business. As I just said, the newly independent credit card companies will be allowed to develop first full service banks, at which time Bank Leomi and Bank of Polim will be allowed to re-enter the credit card business de novo, increase competition to improve credit availability and services for Israeli consumers. Isra Israelis do have credit cards, but those credit cards are um, not quite as generous as the credit card system that we're familiar with in the United States. There's much less credit on those credit cards. They're more expensive. In fact, they're uh, more similar to installment plans rather than the more generous credit system that we're familiar with. All right, so Israel has been through several phases. As I mentioned, there was the initial startup phase when Israel was a socialist monopolized economy. There was the transition phase as that socialist system failed and the privatization process created a private monopolized economy. And then starting in 2005, the era of competition began as Israel transitions, transitioned and continues to transition from a uh, monopolized private economy to a competitive uh, market economy. What does the future look like? Well, the future looks like a start from moving from that startup phase to scaling up Israeli enterprises, financial markets, and the economy and society as a whole. The restructuring of the Israeli economy has left its mark on the entire financial system. First, let's talk about why the Israeli financial system has grown by leaps and bounds. If you recall, I mentioned just in passing that during the 1980s, when Israel was uh, experiencing hyperinflation, printing money and uh, record budget deficits, debt to GDP, the debt to GDP ratio actually at that time exceeded 200% of GDP, higher than Greece achieved at its peak during the Euro crisis of 2011 and 2012. Even as Israel transitioned out of that, uh, ex uh, that, ex that excessive amount, it still carried almost 100% debt to GDP, even in the mid-1990s. Ever since the 1980s with the Economic Stabilization Plan, 
successive Israeli governments have enacted debt targets that have moved Israel's debt level ever lower. They moved the debt level, as I mentioned, from 200% to the, about 100% from the mid 80s to the mid 90s. And just on the eve of COVID, Israel had moved its debt to GDP ratio to 60%, 23 percentage points lower than the United States at the same time. Even with COVID, of course, Israel faced many of the same financial pressures that the rest of the world did. It had to increase its debt a bit, moving it up to the upper 70s in terms of 70% uh, de debt to GDP. Still, it remains about 30 something percentage points below the United States. It's been far more fiscally conservative than the United States. In fact, of all of the world's developed economies, Israel is the only developed economy to reduce its debt burden before, during, and after the financial crisis. That has given Israel tremendous flexibility and financial firepower to invest in a whole host of areas, most particularly infrastructure. GDP growth, the growth of the Israeli economy in the 10 years since the financial crisis, and I'm using the years 2009 to 2019 uh, because, of course, the COVID period um, has thrown a wrench in the works, even though Israel is recovering uh, much more rapidly than even the United States. Uh, I think this period gives us a bit of a better look on what the long-term potential is, because I think the future in the next decade has equal potential to the prior decade. We'll talk about why. But Israel grew at just under 4% between 2009 and 2019, faster than the United States, faster than the European Union. It's one of the fastest growing developed economies in the world. Why? Well, there's a few reasons. Not only is Israel's population growth just about 1.7% per year, meaning Israel has the fastest population growth in the developed world. Uh, just to put that in perspective, population growth in the United States has averaged just a little bit under half a percent per year. And other European countries like Germany are experiencing negative population growth. Israel maintains a robust population growth, surpassing 9 million people over the last year or so. Why do I start there? Because of course, when we talk about startup nation of a 600, uh, with a population of 600,000 in 1948, we're now talking about a country that exceeds 9 million on its way to well above 10 or 15 million in the coming generation. And now Israel is bigger than many other uh, countries that uh, you might be surprised to learn about. Israel's more than double the size of Ireland. It's more than double the size of Singapore, it's bigger than Denmark, it's about the same size as Sweden. It's still a small country, but it needs larger scale institutions and larger scale economic enterprises to match its growing scale in terms of its population. Um, not only has it been scaling up in terms of population, as I mentioned, it's been transforming its economic policies to be more market friendly. You may be surprised to learn that Israel decreased its corporate tax rate from 61% in 1990 to 23% today. The infrastructure is there. What is missing is the foreign capital to scale up the economy. Domestic capital is growing. Israel's savings rate is robust, but it's still largely ignored by foreign investors. Who are those foreign investors, if not us? Why is it important to increase capital flow into the Israeli markets? Number one, Israeli companies could raise more capital from stock offerings. That would help solve the early exit problem, not just for technology companies, but for a whole range of industries. It would create greater liquidity for all investors and Israeli companies could better live up to their global potential. Now, lest you think that this is not already occurring, it is, it's a process. For example, when we started Israel Investment Advisors um, on August 1st of 2010, the total value of the Israeli stock market, what is known as market capitalization, 
was $150 billion. Today, due to growth in the markets, IPOs, and growing capital, particularly domestic capital, the total market capitalization of the Israeli stock market is $400 billion. It's in process, but a lot more could be done to, uh, so that Israel could live up to its potential. How do we know this? Because Israel lives in an unbalanced reality. If you look at the United States over the last decade, technology startups raised $647 billion from venture capitalists. And uh, the United States is one of the most robust venture capital markets in the world. Nonetheless, the big money was raised on the stock market, $2.2 trillion during the same period of time. That makes sense because startups are where you begin with a little bit of money. And when you need to scale up, you raise a lot more from many millions of people on the stock market. Because Israel has attracted the attention of major venture capital investors, it is able to raise substantial venture, venture capital uh, assets, $39 billion over the last decade. But total stock offerings have been lower than venture capital, 22 billion. That is unusual in the world. Israel continues to attract robust venture capital, but it needs to attract more capital for more mature enterprises on the stock market. That's what we uh, offer to our investors. Once again, why is this important? It's true that Facebook was a very promising startup for its early investors, but it was also a very successful um, investment for those who invested after the IPO. Most of Facebook's growth in its employees, revenues, profits occurred in the years following its IPO, following its issuance of stock on the stock market. That's what Israel needs. In order to produce more Facebooks, Googles, Microsofts, you need to have robust capital markets to allow promising startups to raise the big money to scale up into the next Facebook or uh, major uh, enterprise. As we've just outlined, just in this short presentation, the three-part uh, transition of the Israeli economy from a socialist startup to a restructuring opportunity, and now on its way to a more competitive free market future has created opportunities for investors. When investors learn about these opportunities, we often get three instant reactions. Which one are you? Are you an investigator? You search for reasons why this opportunity won't work for you. You keep doing more research. The information becomes overwhelming and you never take action because you have paralysis by analysis. Maybe you're the maybe someday kind of investor. You see the potential, you get excited, but you don't take immediate action because you're waiting for the right day. But you never get the rewards because you wait too long. The last decade, the last 11 years that we've uh, run the Israel Investment Fund at Israel Investment Advisors have been very robust. That does not mean that the, that the opportunity is over. It does not mean that we're not still on the ground floor. In many ways, we are. Or are you number three, the contributor? You commit to investing, supporting and advancing the Jewish legacy for yourself and Israel, and you believe you are ready for this. We want to make this easy for you to be a number three. We don't want anything to hold you back from aligning your investment dollars with your core values and expanding your investment portfolio to the Israeli market. We believe there's a double bottom line. The, committed, the contributors are committed to a purpose. They have a sense of ownership for the, what they want to achieve and don't take no for an answer. The contributors aim for number one, profitability, while simultaneously incorporating their core mission into their investment portfolio. You don't need to be a mission-oriented investor to invest in the Israeli market. It works on its own. Nonetheless, we find that those who are understand this story and are committed to the story uh, more, more so. Mission-related investments. The contributors love to break new ground, 
They find different angles to provide solutions to everyday and major challenges their community is facing and bridge the gap between impact and investment, business and philanthropy, mission and purpose. Impact investing is the highest form of tzedakah. According to the great Jewish philosopher, uh, philosopher and teacher Maimonides, in the Mishnah Torah, there are several levels of tzedakah. Many people believe the highest level of tzedakah is charity, when a giver is anonymous and generous to giving those in need. That's not what Maimonides said. No, the highest level of tzedakah is going into business partnership with a fellow Jew in order to afford them independence and autonomy. What is the 21st century equivalent of Maimonides' highest level of tzedakah, if not investing in the, in the stock market in Israeli companies, particularly when you do not have to sacrifice return or risk to do so? If you represent a foundation, as many of our investors do, or even if you're investing as your own single investor, your impact is your legacy. Commitment to your purpose, your core mission, and your action-oriented spirit that is shaping the world around you. You can be the one opening the door for your vision of prosperity. This is why we offer you an opportunity to expand your core values into your investment portfolio and book a call with Amy Kaufman, our Director of Investor Relations. Let me explain to you what will happen on the call. If you are an accredited investor who get on the call, you'll have more detailed questions answered. You'll learn about the details of the feasibility of investing in Israel through our fund. Hear the regulatory requirements to document accredited investor status and get an explanation of the required legal documents and process to fund investment. By the way, I apologize. I know there's been constant sirens. I don't know why that has, so I hope that those of you on this webinar can't hear that, but in any case, I apologize about it. What happens after this masterclass? You will receive a follow-up email with details about booking your call. Amy will reach out to you to, uh, with available spots to book your spot. We have limited capacity in our fund. We're a limited partnership. Um, I know uh, somebody just asked a question about why we're a limited partnership. Well, Israel is a small market and it's very difficult to access if you have an expensive fund like a mutual fund that's driven us towards, uh, the way, particularly for the strategy that we employ, which is um, if you want to put it into a category more like a Warren Buffett approach, rather than um, just buying every hot stock that is currently uh, popular at the moment. Israel has plenty of those these days, by the way. No, we want to have a long-term fundamental approach. And that is why we have a limited partnership with limited capacity. So you need to, uh, if you want to get involved, you're better off acting sooner rather than later. Okay, let me um, look at the Q&A and see what questions have been asked. Okay, I see somebody asked about the LP instead of a 40 Act. Um, if you want more details, definitely call Amy. The bottom line is in order to employ our strategy, it's uh, a fairly small niche in a market that is growing and we think has great potential, but still on the small side. So that's why um, we have done it in a limited partnership uh, format. Okay, and I see a couple of other uh, questions. They relate to um, some things that we've already discussed. Okay, let me give you some color commentary. It looks like a couple of the questions that I've received um, relate to a couple of additional slides. Let me cue that up. Give me one minute. Okay. Why did we start the um, Israel Investment Fund uh, in the first place? And why did we start it in 2010? Well, um, as I mentioned, um, I personally, Brian Friedman, are one, I'm one of the few Americans that have paid a great deal of uh, attention to the Israeli markets over a long period of time. And for most of those years, the Israeli markets were very immature, 
They were under-regulated, they were small, and I did not feel, even though I had a personal interest, that they were ready to be um, a, prof to be, they weren't professional enough for our standards um, to put a fund together for the investing public. What really changed was, uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, first, the Bahar Committee, that really began the transformation of the Israeli capital markets to something much more robust. Um, one of the other corollaries uh, flowing, not just from the Bukhar Committee, but a whole series of reforms, Israel beefed up its securities regulation system. It created a system very similar to what we have in the United States. Um, and then, of course, the financial crisis intervened. And so why 2010? Well, something happened in 2010 that a lot of people are not familiar with. Israel was invited to join an organization called the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. The OECD, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is like the club of wealthy countries. And Israel, at that time, it was sort of um, a coming out party where Israel was recognized no, as a developed country. Well, that's good news. The bad news is the major index companies, if you think about indexes like the S&P, uh, Dow Jones, well, the major foreign index company is called MSCI. They removed Israel from the Emerging Markets Index, where Israel was a fairly decent percentage of that index, and moved it into the Developed Country Index, where very few, almost none, almost no Israeli companies qualified for inclusion. So Israel went from a a uh, decently sized fish in a small pond to a very tiny minnow in a giant ocean. And as a result, if you think about emerging markets funds, like the Vanguard Emerging Markets Funds, for example, they're tied to indexes. So when Israel was removed from the Emerging Markets Index, um, these funds sold out of the Israeli markets. People don't realize Israel has already been divested from, not because of politics, but because of this transition to developed country status, the foreign capital never came back. And that's when I realized, and we at Israel Investment Advisors realized that the time had come. Because if we didn't start something that we had already been paying attention to, and I personally had been following since I was a teenager, who else would do it? We needed to create a product because the opportunities were great and the uh, attention on the Israeli market was very minimal. So that's why we started it in August of 2010. Israel left the indexes, the Emerging Markets Index, uh, on June 30th of 2010, and we launched on August 1st of 2010. And foreign capital has slowly been coming back, but very slowly. And we want to be part of that process. And that's why we're appealing to you to join us, to become part of that process. If it's not pro-Israel Americans paying attention to this, who, who's going to do it, if not us? Um, okay, we got a question. Which Israeli companies are trying to become successful long-term <clears throat> as opposed to startups that are quickly sold? And how are they trying to do that? Great question. So um, maybe the best way I could answer that is by talking about um, what's going on right now. Because um, Israel is in the midst of an IPO boom somewhat similar to the United States. So for example, um, there's a couple of uh, recent offerings of uh, digital advertising companies. I don't know how many of you have heard of companies, Taboola and Outbrain. Uh, these are both Israeli companies. They um, help basically place what are known as native digital ads. They place these ads on, web, on news websites, when you go to the bottom of a, of a news article and you see all of the, uh, you know, you may want to also read, very often that's a company like Taboola or Outbrain, and they tend to be the biggest players. Well, before the IPO market really opened up in the last 18 months, there was some debate about how would these two companies raise the capital necessary to expand their business and really jump on the major opportunities in the ever expanding digital advertising marketplace. Um, but because capital is starting to flow, it's been growing over these last 11 years. And now the IPO market has opened up. 
to a much greater extent than it did before. Both of those companies were able to go public, uh, one through a traditional IPO, another through what's known as a SPAC. I won't get into all those details. The bottom line is those types of situations are starting to evolve more and more in Israel so that the, uh, a company, companies like Taboo and Outbrain don't need to sell to the larger advertising companies. They've been able to raise capital on the stock market. There's many, many others that fall into that category. Um, and it's still a mixed bag. In, in the first half of the year, there were 60 uh, IPOs of Israeli companies, mostly technology. There's right now 90 or so on the docket for the second half of the year. But this is really the first year that we'll see more than 100 IPOs of Israeli companies. Typically, in a, in, before the more, most recent boom, you'd be lucky if you got 20. So a lot of the efforts uh, by investors like us um, are starting to draw some attention to what's going on in the Israeli market. And we're in the very beginning, perhaps the bottom of the first inning in solving some of these early exit uh, problems. Um, let's see. Okay, who may invest in the Israel Investment Fund? Accredited investors. Um, let me just say about accredited investors, um, that's the US government um, regulation. That's not our regulation. I don't want to get into some of the details. You need to have net worth minimums, uh, um, income minimums, sometimes experience um, requirements. When you talk to Amy on your call, she'll be able to go through those details and help you determine um, how to best verify your accredited investor status. And um, Right now, the minimum is $100,000. So this is not for small investors. And to be honest, we're looking for investors that have the capacity to invest well above $100,000 over time. We want those investors who are accredited, who have capacity to invest more than $100,000 to feel comfortable with us and what we do. But because there are limitations on the number of investors that we can have, our minimum is $100,000. And we are looking for investors with capacity well above 100,000. Um, we are now one minute before the hour. We promised that this would take no more than an hour and I wanna stick to my promise. So I wanna thank all of you for joining us um, on this masterclass. Uh, we tried to fit in quite a bit of information in a thumbnail sketch in a short period of time both about what's going on in Israel over the course of time, what the future looks like, and a little bit about who we are and what we do at Israel Investment Advisors. Of course, there is no substitute to just getting to know us. Reach out to Amy and she can tell you some of the details, book a call, go through some of the ins and outs and schedule further conversations to learn more about us uh, at Israel Investment Advisors and the Israel Fund. And if you'd like more about the Israeli financial markets and economy. I want to thank you for your time and attention, and uh, I look forward to hearing from you and having further interactions in the future. Thank you.
Wayne, I am going to answer that question very simply that you sent, will these um, funds get us access to IPOs for direct purchase in addition to those made by the fund? Um, in our case in particular, we have a fund and sometimes the fund invests in IPOs, but most of the times based on our benchmarking and our philosophy of investing, um, we invest in companies that are well-established, um, a little bit like the um, Warren Buffett, Buffett style, which is companies that have low debt, um, growth, reasonable value, et cetera. Hopefully that answered your question, but I'm happy to meet with you in the future and, and tell you a little bit more. And if there are no more questions, I'm going to um, say good night. And tomorrow, for those of you who celebrate, Shabbat Shalom. Bye-bye.